Uh, welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana. And uh, tonight I'm here with Mike Alowitz, our local agitprop artist and a uh, person with a long history of, of activism. And I guess this is sort of the post-election show because last week we uh, showed video of the Armistice Day concert in uh, New London and didn't do anything live. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. It's always good to be here. And, you know, just before we, you know, really came into view, um, it, today, well, this month or last month is 20 years that we've been doing this show. I, and I didn't start it all by myself. There were five of us. Everyone else kind of over the last 20 years has kind of moved away or in some cases passed away. But, um, yeah, and almost exactly 20 years ago in, in November, you know, during my November rotation slot, my guest was Mazen Kumsia, who was a Palestinian professor at Yale, who is now um, the, the director of the Palestine Institute for uh, Biodiversity and Sustainability, mm. who will be in Connecticut in December. So maybe we'll have more about him later. But uh, Mike, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I know that you know, from knowing you for several years, that you are very um, critical of what elections can really do and what difference they make compared to how much hoopla they generate. So um, what can elections do and what can't they do? Elections have never won anything, never. Uh, all the major social change that we've won in this country, and we've had very militant fights in this country, um, the right to organize, the right to speak on street corners, um, the right to organize on campus, the right to organize in high schools, uh, the right to organize among GIs, uh, the right of women to vote, uh, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the women's movement, the gay movement, none of this had anything to do with politicians and their elections. The elections are theater, and they're theater to immobilize people on the one hand, and on the other hand also to convince people that we live in a democracy, as though going into a voting booth in voting for one or another capitalist candidate that basically sta all stand for the same thing um, is, is some meaningful uh, kind of uh, democracy. We don't get to decide anything. We don't decide what happens with the environment. We don't decide what is produced. We don't decide um, where industry is built. We don't decide how housing works. We don't decide how educated, we have nothing to do with these things. And these are very elaborate, uh, um, you know, choreographed uh, theater, the elections. Um, being, work, being in the Scenic Artists Union, you know, I'm always looking from behind the camera and, you know, it's all, there's the costumers and the, you know, the hairdressers and the lighting people and, you know, all this stuff is, is you know, they try to make it look good. Um, but it's a dying empire, and uh, when an empire is dying, it's not pretty. So whereas uh, when capitalism was lively, um, you know, 
however horrific it was, um, it tended to attract thinkers. You know, you look back at the found, founding fathers who, you know, were slave owners and just really trying to start a new capitalist country. But even so, they were thinkers, they were artists, they were uh, philosophers, you know, they were inventors. Um, now look at what we get. Um, we just get the worst of society. We get the worst of society. It's just because you have to be a horrid person. You have to lose your humanity uh, to become one of these big politicians. You, you have to be totally unempathetic and you have to be totally immoral. The amount of money that went into this last election was astounding to me. I, I haven't been registered as a Democrat or a Republican for over 20 years, and I was getting emails from both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, uh, primarily the presidential campaigns, probably five emails a day for like six weeks before the election. And well, they're trying to convince people to vote. People are not stupid. Um, even though people go out and vote, even though they've been, it's been beaten into them, you have to go vote. But people aren't stupid. They know that, it, you know, it really is not a fundamental change. So they have to be prodded into it. So on the one hand, uh, you have, you know, this right wing, uh, the Trump approach where, you know, you're whipping up this hysteria against and, immigrants and, and stuff. And kind of bringing us to... to to where the movie Idiocracy starts looking <laughs> like a documentary. I, I, the news I heard today was that Frank Oz, Dr. Oz, was just <laughs> appointed head of Medicaid and Medicare. I uh, gotta tell you, Trump is entertaining. <laughs> oh my it's God. It's really, I mean, it's like, it's like they're sitting around in the Oval Office and they're going, What's going to make them, what's really going to make them cringe? Or, you know, let's just really fuck with them. Let's, let's put uh, Getz in charge. Yeah. And, 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 you know, they haven't put the onion out of business yet, but I think, you know, it, it, it's hard. Satire can't really beat reality right now. Uh, if you, if I, I listened to Jon Stewart when, it, when I happened to scroll through, and... Instead of him being funny and making fun, he doesn't, he can't do that anymore. He's just outraged and yelling at them, you know. Uh, really, how do you top them for being outrageous? You can't. You can't. It's no, because Dr. Oz is uh, supervisor. <laughs> if he's, you know, if he's doing Medicare Medicaid, his supervisor, I guess, is RFK Jr. Yes. in Health and Human Resources. Yes. And so, I mean, I, I just, it is, it, it, it's, very, it's a very strange place we're in in this country. Well, right here's now. the thing, because people, I think, are a little hysterical about this stuff. The fact of the matter is, uh, these guys don't really decide anything. Government grinds on through the institutions that the ruling class has. It has think tanks, it has lobbyists, it has enormous numbers of people employed. Uh, you know, Donald Trump doesn't make a decision about Ukraine. He's told what to do. He, he represents, I think, some part of the ruling class. Her, her, this, this election, I think, represented a rift more than we've seen in recent years. Uh, not that there's a fundamental disagreement, but there, obviously there's different interests. There's American first interests. There's people who want to have global things. You know, we don't know really what's behind it all because it's secret. We don't know what treaties, what deals, and all that kind of stuff that determine politics. But certainly it's not because, um, you know, it's not Donald Trump knows what the Ukraine uh, situation is and he wants to do something. It, these people don't know anything. They're told what to do. They follow orders. They're flunkies, basically. Uh, the government grinds on regardless uh, of who sits in the White House and who's in the Senate. So, so you know, uh, there's certainly meaning in these elections, but regardless of who won, it was, there's gonna it's going to follow a pattern of where it was going to go anyway. Um, you know, it, they're going to uh, go right down in the sinking ship of Israel. You know, they're not going to back off on this. Um, and, uh, you know, 
they're, they're going to continue to erode immigrant rights, although they're not going to get rid of millions of, of immigrant workers. No, although I do fear that the people coming, you know, in through this southern border are going to be treated worse and worse. Yeah, but that would have happened under the Democrats as well. Uh, it did. It didn't know. really get fixed in the four years between these two well, The only way to fix it is to, is to take down the walls and have open borders <laughs> so that people can move wherever they want. I remember when the Berlin Wall fell and <laughs> there was much celebration. And then since then, it seems like, I don't know if it's the whole world, but the U.S. and its allies have really been on a wall building spree. Oh, jeez. In, in uh, Israel and Palestine, it's insane. It's I won't go back, insane. actually. I, well, I haven't been back since 1974. They might not let you in anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, hey, all this stuff is, is going to go on. Now, it's certainly these right-wingers have got some wind in their sails. Um, but... They're not fascists. They don't represent. There is no fascist movement in this country. The people who voted for Donald Trump, a lot of them voted for Barack Obama. You know? And they're not fascists. They're workers who are angry. And they have a right to be angry. Now, a lot of times that anger is misdirected. But um, they hate what the government is. Um, and they hate what their lives or how miserable their lives have been made. Um, I think of it as like road rage for a lot of these people. It's just, you know, uh, fuck it, I'm going to vote for Trump. And, you know, the liberal uh, comedians and the pundits, you know, they go out and they find these caricature MAGA people, you know, and, you know, they interview them and, you know, it's these yahoos that just say stupid things. And really, it's trying to portray, you know, these millions of workers as all being like that. And that's just not true. That's just not true. Um, Meanwhile, you know, are, are the people who support the AOCs and the Bernie Sanders, uh, are, are they less confused and less uh, have a ridiculous uh, position? Uh, Bernie Sanders um, has been a longtime Zionist and supporter of Israel and uh, supported all the funding. AOC, same thing. Um, you know, they make little peeping noises because we're out protesting. Um, but... Uh, so, you know, these elections, we are going to have to defend ourselves. We're in a different mm -hmm. period, I think. And we're going to have to mobilize. We're going to have to defend ourselves. Um, but really, we have the power to stop all this stuff. We have the power to stop the attacks on women and immigrant workers and all this. Um, if one of the major unions, if these parasitic bureaucrats that run our unions, if a couple of them even said, we need a march on Washington, there'd be a million workers in Washington. There'd be a million workers in Washington. Uh, and they'd sign up to join unions. But th it's, a, it's an ossified bureaucracy. Uh, they're terrified. They are just going to what they, the lesson they are going to draw from this is that you have to work harder for the Democrats. So the same losing strategy that they've had for the last 50 years, will they'll double down on it. I, I, I'm seeing quite a lot of doubling down. I wanted to ask for the first slide I had uh, found. You know, uh, you know, you and I are Facebook <laughs> friends. And in the lead up to the election and right after, I don't know if people will be able to read this, but the first slide on the left is a comment on the um, the poor quality of debates. And I have to say, I've noticed this on a local level as well, that 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when we had municipal elections, all the candidates showed up and there was a pretty lively exchange of ideas and people seemed pretty informed about the city and candidates seemed willing to talk to the people who lived here. And um, in 2023, when we had municipal elections, there was not, there was one debate, no incumbents attended, and um, 
the level of, of, of knowledge at, w was really low, and the voter turnout was down about 20 percent compared to the mayoral race four years before. Well, what these local elections are is after they've taken all the wealth and given it to the military and given it to, um, you know, uh, their projects, they throw some crumbs to, to like a town like New London, and we get a few little crumbs, and we fight over your crumbs. I mean, that's what the elections are about. Uh, meanwhile, you've got electric boat building, nuclear submarines, um, hundreds of billions of dollars go into the war machine. Uh, you've got the Coast Guard Academy. You know, you, <laughs> you got Pfizer. You got, you know, you have these monsters that get billions and billions of yeah. our tax dollars. And where do the tax dollars come from? It comes from us working. Um, so they get that, and then they throw us a few crumbs, and uh, we get to fight over those. You know, sometimes there's some important issues, but really, um, if you're really going to fundamentally change anything, it has to be a giant revolutionary change that encompasses the whole country and is international. I mean, that's the only solution. That's the only. That's the solution to housing in New London. Now, that seems like a lot to people. You say, okay, um, you know, I had a yeah. student walk out of one of my classes. <laughs> Is, Only you once, know, huh? So we had this discussion, and he says, you know, I can't, I can't afford to pay for school, and it's just like that. And I said, well, you got all the money going to the war machine. You know, the other advanced capitalist countries have free education for everybody. And so, free health care. Yeah, and free health care. So if you want to do that, you have to make a revolution. <laughs> this guy gets up and he goes, I'm leaving. I, can't. <laughs> I just came oh, in to man. learn how to draw. <laughs> Oh, now, I yeah. make, now I have to make a revolution. But, you know, that's what happens because it's such an overwhelming thing. You know, you, people can't get up in the morning and go, okay, the species is going to be extinct if we don't do something. Uh, so what am I going to do today to stop that? No, you, you get up and you, do I have gas money? Do I, you know, how am I going to get to work? What's going to happen? What am I doing tonight? Um, you have to live your life. Um, and, but the fact of the matter is, if we don't have a transformation, a global transformation, unlike anything that's ever happened before, um, then we really are face species suicide. Because these people are out of control. They just want more. They just want more. Um, they don't, this is not a vision. The ruling class at this point, um, it's a dying empire, the U.S. ruling class, uh, and they don't have a vision of the future. They don't have a vision. They're not. It's the the robber barons, as horrible as they were. Uh, they they had a. They wanted to build something. They wanted. I mean, they wanted us to build something. They wanted <laughs> you know railroads. They wanted in steel industry. They wanted these things. What do these guys want? What does Musk want? He want a He wants another hundred billion dollars. Um, None of them produce anything, uh, you know, as close as it comes to producing something is a little toy for himself to go in outer space. You know, so it, it's, they're really, they're really very weak, but the problem is we have no leadership. We have no leadership. Um, because the unions, the major women's organizations, the major civil rights organizations, um, are just run by bureaucrats that are unwilling to act. But, you know, in 2006, right, largest working class demonstration in U.S. history when the immigrant <laughs> workers took to the streets. Now, you're not, you can't tell me that people would not come out in their millions if there was a call to defend immigrant worker rights. There would. Of course right. there would. And, you know, and any, any of the major unions could do that. And a couple of these politicians, AOC yeah. and Bernie Sanders, call yeah. for a march on Washington, everybody, you know. Yeah. Uh, people would just start building it. But they're not going to do that because they're more afraid of us than they are of Trump. Well, so you and I, we're, we're both old. <laughs> and when I was thinking about... We're seasoned. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice way to put it. Uh, in the middle of the night, I 
was sort of awake thinking about this conversation today, and it occurred to me that this recent election had some parallels with 1968 when we were both teenagers uh, before uh, people under 21 could vote. And um, when LBJ uh, decided not to run for a well, we another drove term. Well, we drove him from office. Right, be, uh, because of the uh, be, because of the Vietnam War, yes. largely. Yes. And he was replaced by, on the ticket, with his uh, Hubert Humphrey, his vice president, Dump the hunt. who ended up um, losing to Nixon, the more hawkish Republican. So it seems... Well, Nixon it would be far to the left of these jokers. Well, that is true. I mean, I think of people no, like didn't. Nixon and Eisenhower um, as, yeah, left, a, a bit well, left of where the Democrats are now. Oh, yeah. Well, on their political positions. Yeah. Because, because there was um, the anti-war movement. And that is what changed this. When you think about what the anti-war movement accomplished, um, well, first the civil rights movement. Um, the civil rights movement had a profound effect on the politics and culture of this country and internationally. You know, I go and paint murals all over the world, and everywhere you go, people express their admiration for the civil rights movement in the U.S. because you had a small persecuted minority uh, facing uh, the entire uh, racist uh, structure of society, and they managed to divide it and take major advances. Now, of course, we know that electing uh, Barack Obama did not mean that uh, we have completed the tasks of the civil rights movement. In fact, things are getting worse for black people and Latino people and people of color. Um, but it showed the power of a mass movement. Then the anti-Vietnam War movement totally transformed politics of this country. Uh, it took us from the, conserva the conservative 1950s. Uh, there was a cultural revolution. Um, it so transformed things. It gave, it gave birth to the, anti, um, to the women's movement, to the gay liberation movement, to the ecological movement. Um, we started out as a minority. Uh, my first demonstration was organized, I organized in my high school. I got beat up. It was 1967 or 8. Um, by 1970, we were a majority movement um, when the shootings at Kent took place. Um, uh, the fraternities, you had to walk past all the fraternities to go downtown, and it would, they'd always hassle the long hairs, you know, uh, until uh, the invasion of Cambodia, the beginning of the National Student Strike, and when the, uh, when the Guard came in and when there was repression, suddenly the frat houses were all open, come in, you're safe in here. Um, and it was a turning point. Uh, we, drove, um, we drove Lyndon Johnson out of office, we drove Nixon out of office. Uh, it totally transformed the country. Now, we won, we defeated the U.S. ruling class. And how did we do that? We did it by organizing millions of people, just regular people. Um, we organized demonstrations all over the country, in every city, in every town. Um, I ended up in Texas after the shootings at Kent, and I was involved in, I don't know if you can show that slide. Oh, yeah, can we show the third slide? We'll skip the second one for now. Um, uh, about the anti-war demonstrations. Yeah. Um, well, what you're going to see, that is yeah. a demonstration outside Fort Hood in Colleen, Texas. This is in 1970. I am on the far right in a white shirt. It's active duty GIs against the war. GIs couldn't march in uniform, so they would have these little white caps. Uh, we organized, my experience was we organized students from the University of Texas. We would go on to the bases and just throw, throw leaflets out the window. And the GIs would have to police the grounds, as they call it. And they'd get, so they'd find out about the demonstrations and everything. I was once invited to meet with soldiers in their barracks 
when I was up there leafleting. That is how it got. And I would encourage everyone to watch a movie called Sir No yeah. Sir. The, the guy who uh, made that film is just to my right. We were co-captains oh. that day. Um, because what we did is we reached deep into the working class in the Army. And these GIs did one of the most heroic, greatest acts of internationalism that North American labor ever did. And they, re they basically refused to wage the war in Vietnam. And uh, they, the U.S. had to pull out because they were, they were losing the army. There were ships that were taken over. Uh, people were fragging their officers. Um, and they were just refusing to fight. Um, and that's what, what caused the end of the war in Vietnam. Well, of course, the resistance of the Vietnamese was at the right, heart of it. Right, but, but also that, and, and you know, our peace group showed that movie maybe almost 20 years ago, and it is a great movie. I think I still have it on my shelf as well. Uh, but yeah, that one of the significant things that ended the war in Vietnam is that the GIs weren't willing to fight it anymore. Do you think that now having no draft and having a, an all enlisted army, um, it's harder? Well, uh, I don't think that, it, certainly the draft was an issue. Um, you know, when I, when I graduated high school, you, didn't, you weren't going like, what am I gonna study? Where, what kind of career do I want? <laughs> it was just, <laughs> what the hell's gonna keep me out of Vietnam? And we still had student deferments then, so that's why I went to college. Um, I was not a good college student. Uh, but people had all kinds of things. Uh, my friend John Connolly, who ended up being president of the Actors Union after, uh, kept moving every three months so that the paperwork <laughs> would never catch up with him. My brother went to Canada. You know, people shot their toes off. They, you know, they did all kinds we of things. We went to Israel, crazy <laughs> us. And, um, and when we came back to the United States, you know, Bob didn't have a, a passport. He, uh, they had taken his passport away when we uh, got passports for our, our kids that were born there. And they gave him a letter of passage that basically <laughs> said, let this guy go come back to the States, but don't let him in anywhere else. <laughs> and he, as soon as he touched down in, in Portland, Oregon, um, he surrendered himself to the you know, feds who were waiting for him. We were so lucky, though, because we came back in April of uh, 1974, and uh, Richard Nixon had his hands full at that point uh, with Watergate, and he was on his way out, and Gerald Ford had already said he would have some kind of amnesty, but it wasn't really in place. And when Bob was declared delinquent and indicted, they had, the, his draft board had skipped a couple of steps and DOJ just dropped the charges. A million stories out there. There are. But to, I, I do want to get back to yeah. this for one moment because um, I think uh, it's very important to understand that what the student movement, the role of the student movement, because that was the backbone of the militant anti-war movement. and. You know, as I, I briefly mentioned, we would organize students to go on to the bases and stuff. And it's that, it was that strategy. It was the idea that you use the campus as a base mm. be, to go out. To, we went to uh, unions. We, went to, we, we leafleted at factories. We leafleted on ba army bases, wherever. The idea was... Well, we were fighting for the anti-war university, what we called the anti-war university. Um, you know, after, after the invasion of Cambodia and the shootings at Kent and Jackson, uh, 400 campuses were occupied, and virtually every campus had actions on it. Um, and we used that as a base to reach out to the GIs. And I, I raise that as an important thing because I think um, these encampments on campus have been wonderful to see, very important, mm. but we have to get beyond that. We have to use the base to reach out, first to the other students, and then beyond the students into the community uh, and into, 
It's, it's different army today, you know, because um, basically you have an economic draft. Right. Um, and I don't think, um, I don't think that the army today is, is any more conservative, really, than it was. Because don't forget, we've had the experience now of um, the victory in Vietnam, the women's movement, all these things. So, and we have the internet, which is the largest political discussion that's ever taken place on the planet. And these soldiers have been exposed to all that, you know, um, and so they're, they're a lot worldlier in many ways than we were. Mm. You know, we didn't have that stuff. I used to find out what was going on when I was at Kent organizing. We, we, I would go down to the bus station once a week get a socialist newspaper and find out what had happened two months ago, <laughs> you know, and uh, now it's instantaneous and it's this global discussion. You we know? might be going back though because I've been seeing, you know, concerns that what we're seeing in Lebanon and in Palestine that people who, you know, are, are on the phone with the wrong people might be visited by drones that you know, or coming after them. So I've been seeing some discussions started about, well, if we don't want to use our phones, which give our location and a lot of information that we don't want the wrong people to know, like, what well, are we going to go back to? Okay, I have a lot of confidence <laughs> that people, especially young people, can figure their way around this. You know, and, and ultimately, don't forget, all of this stuff is run by workers, you know, all of the technology. You know, there's a very interesting story in Sir No Sir. I knew, uh, one of, I knew a lot of those people, and, and uh, I knew Tom Bernard, um, and uh, I had worked with him on a project out in Centralia and stuff. I did not know, you know, he was telling some of those stories about how they misdirected oh. strikes, you know, and see, and to me, it's like, okay, see, you have to get to that point. You know, uh, people know what to do. People know what to do. Um, the, the problem is the political problem. The problem is uh, that we have to build, and, and it is building. You know, in the U.S., they're trying to go, we, we were talking about this before, you know, they're trying to shut the stuff down on campus. They're going after students and stuff. That's not, they're not going to, uh, students aren't afraid of that. They're standing up to it. And they're not going to turn it around. Uh, for the very simple reason, it's a global movement. It's an international movement, you know. It, and there are millions of people marching in Europe. There are millions of people marching all over the world. And you can't stop it in this little enclave in the U.S. Um, you know, it's, it's, There'll be fights, there'll be important fights, they may be hard fights, but we're winning more people to the anti-war movement. We're not losing people, we're, we're gaining more. Ultimately, we're gonna win. Um, and uh, will we pay a price for all this? Yes, we will. Palestinians are paying the price. The Vietnamese paid the price. Um, and, and some people are gonna have to pay the price here, too, because that, that, that's, that's how change happens. You have to pay the price sometimes. Um, but uh, uh, we can win this, and we have to win it. Uh, you know, people romanticize the 60s a little bit. Um, it was before the women's movement, you know. It was, you know, it was, it was really kind of backward, you know. I, I have a hard time <laughs> explaining to young friends how we press the... Uh, 50s and early 60s were. It, it, it's just impossible to imagine. It, it, well, I grew up in a, in a, in a white housing project uh, in Wilmington, Del outside Wilmington, Delaware, next to a black prison farm, a, a oh. youth farm. And it was still segregated. There were people, old people in, I, I now know, there were old people in, the, in, our, in our project that as children went to lynchings and tore the bodies of black people apart as, for souvenirs. 
And, you know, so it was a big change to go to the 60s. And, you know, but even, even in the anti-war movement, you know, uh, still you had these backward ideas, you know. In the 50s, of course, you could beat your wife, she couldn't get any credit, you know, all this stuff. Um, and then eventually, of course, the women's movement really began to dismantle all this stuff. Um, but um, uh, kids today are a lot sharper. And, but we were fighting to end the war in Vietnam, and we were fighting uh, for human liberation. Now we really are fighting for survival. Uh, it, it really, the stakes, I think, in, are, are a lot bigger now. Um, I mean, they're, they're just today, they're, <laughs> they're ramping up the, <laughs> the oh. trillion. <laughs> you know, they're so blinded by greed. Um, and at a, I mean, I'm not a scientist, and you know, I try to follow stuff, but at a certain point, you can't, turn, you can't stick the stuff back in the bottle. And, you know, we're having very lovely spring days here in, in New yeah. London. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, in, in November, we've had a lot of days in the 70s. It was 60 degrees out here today. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. For me, I don't, you know, I'm an old man. I'm going to die before the waters get to the, to the top of the hill where I live. But um, this is frightening. You know, this is very frightening. And, and of course, uh, nations, you know, some of these uh, island nations and stuff, but, yeah, they're going to be underwater. And, you know, it's not only are they continuing this thing, but they have no idea where it's going to end up. You know, they, you know, they make predictions there's going to be bigger hurricanes, there's going to be more fires and all this kind of stuff. But they really don't know how bad it can get and how quickly it can get. We're get, you know, we're, we're in new territory here. Um, you know, and, and maybe the species won't survive. Uh, and maybe our, your 20 year of, which you have hopefully right. uh, uh, filed in a library somewhere, and the next penultimate uh, species or extraterrestrial yeah. group will find it and they'll think we were really important. <laughs> Could be. So I want to pivot now because Sorry, um, <laughs> um, you have painted a lot of murals over the last, I don't know, 40 years, I don't know, related to building solidarity across different walls. So I want to show some of the murals you have done and talk about, okay, this is actually more related to the elections, uh, but I wanted to, uh, I, and I don't know. Well, these are all details from murals. But um, then we can look at the next one that I think it's number four, um, and That's, it's oh my God. the solidarity. That's a terrible. Yeah, it burned out image there. Yeah, it looked okay on my computer screen. Um, but okay. hopefully it looks better on people's uh, TV screens and on, yeah. on, on, on the monitor. Well, but on all this stuff, if you go to redsq.org, redsquare.org, there's all kinds of photo displays and everything. But what this, uh, this was a mural I painted in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, it was one of my first murals, so. Um, I, I think I tried to be sort of in con chronological order. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But it was, it was in, in South Central LA in an area that was, um, you know, just blighted. It was like an occupied territory, uh, you know, and uh, it was, um, yeah, that, okay, so he has it up there and it looks okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was about immigrant workers, you know, and I'm not going to get into explaining the uh, imagery here because uh, the stuff I paint you have to kind of ask what it means but it, it's labor solidarity has no borders and it was in the middle of, a, of an African-American community but they uh, could totally relate to this um, the kids respected the work it wasn't tagged everything else was covered my work was never tagged um, in fact when the Rodney King rebellion took place and a lot of the city was burned down. They didn't, they didn't touch this. Now it was a, it was the library for social studies and research, so 
it, you know, people knew it was a lefty thing, but I'd like to think that my mural may have helped, too, that they didn't want to burn down. The Probably didn't mural. hurt. No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it was basically, uh, you know, what they've done with murals in the U.S., um, this is long before the birth of street art, basically, before graffiti arose um, in, in, as a mass thing. Uh, but spray can art, which was the origins of uh, graffiti, which is the origins of street art, the first real form that took place, was, a, it was an indigenous working class thing. It came out of the black community primarily, it was, and it was linked with uh, hip hop and break dancing. It's a very, you know, multifaceted thing. It's the largest uh, visual art movement in human history. Nothing comes close to it. Every night, tens of thousands of um, street artists go out and do stuff. I mean, this is, it, it, and it, it came out of the working class of the United States, which is a big contribution. The U.S. has always been very musical, you know, uh, it, it's African music, basically, filtered through the experience of, of what happened to uh, the African people who were brought here in, in chains um, and gave us incredible music, gave us the blues, gave us jazz, gave us rock and roll. Um, but there's never been a visual connect aspect to that, really. Um, so uh, spray can art was the first time that that began to happen. And when I started teaching at CCSU, um, it was the first mural course in the country that I could find like this. And when I started street art, it was the only street art. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find anything. Nobody had ever taught street art. So well, how, how long ago was that, this? Not long. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. It was not even 20 years. Um, and, and in, in the 16 years I was teaching, it went from being a outlaw, um, you know, uh, rebellious form to them co-opting it and, you know, bring, trying to bring it into the mainstream. But this is what they yeah. do. You know, we, we produce Little Richard and they produce Pat Boone. You know, you, well, you go back and forth. Well, on the art side, too, I mean, I really do like our nice you know, fancy painted trash cans in New London. <laughs> but I, it is part of that same movement to... Well, here's the thing. It's Mary Delasseur, the great writer, um, she said, and I love this quote, she says, they want you to perfume the sewers. And uh, I think it might even be a birthday yeah. coming up. I always post that on her birthday. Uh, you know, they want you, all these mural programs are just... In, in the last few years, thousands of them all over, every town. Every town wants what, we call, what I call a diversity mural. Mm. You know, so what you do is you, you put some big heads on a wall. You put Martin Luther King, maybe even have Malcolm X, and then you have, I think here they have uh, some, you know, officer from the Coast Guard Academy. And, you know, it's, you say it's a diversity mural. Well, what it does is you're painting over, uh, uh, you're decorating a city that does nothing to really diversify in the sense of, of creating equality uh, and, and supporting those who are the most oppressed and, and need the most help. Um, you know, so it's, it's, you decorate it, you know. Uh, I, I saw one in, in Philly, which has, and they're all funded by, all, most of these programs are funded by banks. And uh, Philly has the biggest one. And I, I, it's a picture, I got a picture of, they were painting a mural on the side of a jail. <laughs> it's, mm. like, <laughs> it's like, how, I mean, that just says it all right there, you know? Although um, I heard that in Philly, the only murals are uh, sculptures that uh, get defaced are the Frank Rizzo ones. Oh. <laughs> they can't keep <laughs> those. Um, I, I'm not surprised. But yeah, so I have a couple other murals yeah. just because, kind of to show. Um, Let's go to that. Yeah, um, there's one, I think this one was something related to the attack this in was, Iraq. Um, this was in Baghdad, I painted this. This was a very fast mural. This was like a one-day mm. mural project, two-day mural project. 
Um, between the wars, uh, I was part of a group that went in defiance of the U.S. embargo and brought medical supplies in. Um, I was, it was with Ramsey Clark and uh, Bishop Gumbleton from Detroit, and so it had cover, you know. Um, interestingly, Ramsey Clark, who, you know, facing mortal their mortality, they get very progressive at the end. And um, but he was he was the he was the one who put me on the um, attorney when he was attorney general. He put me on the attorney general's terrorist list. <laughs> <laughs> and there we were, just one big happy family, um, you know. Uh, so, um, but at any rate, uh, this was painted uh, in Baghdad between the wars. Uh, on the right is Leila al Attar, who was a uh, leading Iraqi uh, artist who Bill Clinton killed with, with a bombing attack. And on the left, it's, it's um, you know, a North American worker, and the planes are dropping bombs, but when they reach the class pans of solidarity, it becomes bread and roses. And there's Uncle Sam getting bonked on the head with, with our medical supplies. And then people put their handprints all around the border, and it, it says uh, artists and workers form one world without borders. I mean, you know, this is a very utilitarian little piece, uh, basically just to say, to express solidarity. Um, and, you know, uh, this is a very organic kind of thing, you know, and I've gone to Ukraine, I've been to these places and I've worked, and, you know, there's a lot of people out here who travel and do things like that, and it's part of building an organic solidarity. and. Uh, when people know, and I, you know, worked in Palestine, and I, you know, um, when people know you're from the U.S. and you're there in solidarity, they treat you like royalty. They, they, you know, there's artists and workers have no problem. You know, carpenters from the U.S. Have, don't have a problem with carpenters um, in in Russia. You know, it's it's governments that have problems, and it's it's competing ruling classes that have problems, and they pit workers against each other. And that's actually kind of a recurring theme in, in your work. Uh, I think we also have a, a mural from the, when you were in Palestine, one of, the, one of the murals you painted during that, that trip. And um, we'll show that because it is yeah. timely. Well, this is, these are all details, but um, yeah. this was, I painted several murals. I painted a mural in the Beit Shabrin refugee camp. And I painted a mural at the Rachel Corey Peace Center, which has since been knocked down by the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. This is part of a mural I painted with um, construct Palestinian construction workers uh, in a village. And there's a wonderful, wonderful little film that came out of this. Um, it's called um, Breaking Walls. And you can go to the Red Square website and get a link to it. And it's about, it was made, it was made by this wonderful filmmaker, and it, it basically shows what happens when you reach out to workers and involve them in a project like this. So it's about the transformation of these workers who, because workers are denied access uh, to a lot of culture. And, um, you know, of course there's a culture that you invent, but when people have a chance to respond, they will do it, you know. People who had never picked up a brush before, you know, uh, were happy to do it. And I've had that experience many places. Um, but uh, working in the occupied territories, um, you see firsthand what a, what a, what a prison it is. In, in all of the murals I painted, you're looking through a broken wall um, because uh, we try to break walls down that exist between people. and you know, uh, ruling classes, because they compete with each other, are trying to build walls. That's what the walls are, are about. They're about breaking solidarity, ultimately. Um, they're about scaring workers. Because, um, you know, there's no wall you can't climb over. You know, people can't. <laughs> you know, uh, half, the, half the construction work going on in the U.S. is, is from immigrant workers, and they know how to climb over the wall. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> what, they know how to build them and they know how to tear them they, down. Exactly, but, exactly. And, and you know, uh, to get back to something we discussed earlier, you know, they will, they may uh, deport a lot of people to instill fear in, in the immigrant working community, but immigrant workers feed us. They feed us, they keep us clean, they make our clothes, they make our shelter, um, and if you really got rid of all the immigrant workers, you would starve. <laughs> People here could not feed themselves. Well, yeah, the animosity or mistrust towards immigrants, I actually find very confusing because, you know, my family hasn't been here, you know, has only been here since about 1910, not much more than 100 years, and probably the same with your family. Yep, they and it, came about the same time, for uh, the same reason, probably. Probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get, get, you know, a flee from the pogroms and, you know, getting pulled into the Tsar's army, so they came to the U.S. Yeah, and, and in some cases there were big families and, you know, the young kids, you know, didn't, you know, We're didn't have anything there, so they went to uh, find their fortune. We're getting a signal that we have to wrap up? Yeah, well, I we have about five minutes, four or oh, five minutes. Okay. I did want to invite people to uh, give us a shout at Red Square. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a lot of displays. Uh, there's all kinds of information on working class struggles, projects we've done. Um, you know, I worked at Chernobyl, and we have a bunch of stuff about how that and what's happening there. Oh, yeah, I was trying to find the Chernobyl mo uh, mural when I was putting this together. That's all right. We, we there's, missed it. there's stuff from Nicaragua. There's stuff, um, and, you know, that, that image there is about uh, 50 feet long. It's a, that's just part of a mural, um, and it's, it's figures... Uh, that had to do with the radical history of New York, which I won't try to explain who they are. But um, anyway, people are invited. Uh, we don't have a staff. We're just, it's just a little volunteer thing. So uh, drop us a note and say you'd like to come, and, and we'd be happy to give you a little tour, get free beer. It's, you know, it's a nice day. Well, you know, I was at this solidarity event in, in Hartford on Saturday, and it was a lot of different groups in solidarity uh, with Palestine. I mean, there was a healthcare workers meetup. There were uh, groups, union people who found out uh, things that union uh, longshoremen around the world are doing to try to prevent arms from getting there. You know, there are people in it. You know, there's a bill in the Senate, and you'd think our Congress people would be doing it, but really probably more is done, being done by longshoremen in Spain and Morocco and other parts well, of the world. Well, in, in the U.S., longshoremen, yeah. for example, they struck uh, and refused to load uh, up uh, yeah. stuff for apartheid South Africa. And I think it's very reasonable to get them to uh, hopefully come to the conclusion they have to do the same thing about uh, apartheid in Israel. Um, you know, we do have a very militant tradition in the labor movement in this country, but it's been buried. They want us, you know, they want to keep it a secret. May Day, the International Hall of the Working Class, is a commemoration of the fight for the eight-hour day in Chicago. Workers all over the world know that, except yeah. we've been kept ignorant. It was a day off when I lived in Israel on Kibbutz. <laughs> May Day was a holiday, <laughs> but not here. So, yeah, so tell people, where is Red Square? Red Not Square that you can miss it. is on Federal Street in New London, and it was um, once the home of the mayor uh, and a prominent banker, uh, Robert Coit, um, and it fell into disrepair. Coit uh, became very wealthy in what they call the West Indies trade. They never... They never call. They never call it the slave they trade. They never. You get a history of New London. There's a book that's a history of London. The word slavery is not in there, but it's the West Indies trade, you know, and that's where the wealth of uh, this country comes from. It comes from slave labor and slave people. Um, you know, it was a huge, created huge amount of capital for the uh, industrialization of the United States, um, and. 
Anyway, it, it fell into disrepair, and we've transformed it a little. It's, it's still a work in progress, but we think this history is very important because just like the history of the anti-war movement is important today to know how we can defeat these people, because we can. We can defeat them. We can drive Trump out of office. We can, we can uh, force an end to the genocide. It's, it's a huge fight, but we do have the potential to do it. Because there are a lot of us. There are millions. Well, thank you, Mike. Always uh, a pleasure. And if anyone is interested in visiting, uh, you have a website, redsq.org. Yep. yep. And um, you're on Facebook, Mike Alowitz, and also Red Square. Uh, so it's easy to reach you. It and uh, I recommend visiting. And if you have any events just coming up, just let us know. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Rana. Yeah, thanks. Always fun to talk to you. And you're such an optimist in some ways. <laughs>